Okay, okay. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just invite uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Terence. Here we go. One, two, three. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, good evening ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Well, I'm, go I'm just going to go straight into this today because of um, um, the, the Facebook has somewhat... Um, slow me down a bit but i want to go straight into this evening because as you as you guys have been aware that mr the great mr mugabe has finally stepped down and there's great celebration in zimbabwe and my name is silver and Sidio, but i'm going to go straight into it because i'm going to invite mr terence mukope member of parliament in the zimbabwean government at present as I uh, want to get some underground feedback, update from Zimbabwe on the developing news that President Robert Gabriel Mugabe has resigned. Honorable Terence Mugabe, good afternoon, how are you? Or good night? <laughs> uh, yeah, good evening. It's like midnight here in Zimbabwe. Yes, as I said earlier, I want to thank your wife for allowing you to be up this late. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're welcome. Yes. You're very much welcome. Yeah. Well, well, thank you so much for joining tonight. Um, can you just give us an update? Well, first of all, give us your position in the in the um the present government structure in Zimbabwe, sir. Okay, I'm I'm a member of parliament uh for uh Harare East. Harare is the capital of Zimbabwe, and Harare East is like the second largest constituency in the in the capital. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a representative of the people of Harare East in the Parliament of Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And I also double up as the uh, Secretary for Information and Publicity within ZANU-PF uh, for the Harare province. Okay, fantastic. So tell us now, give us a, what happened today now? Yeah. Okay. Um, when, when the day started, we had a situation where the president... Uh, was adamant that he was going to resign. Uh, so as parliament, we had made up our minds that like whether he resigns or not, we were going to go ahead and, and impeach him. So earlier in the day, the president had made an invitation to to the vice president, to say the former vice president, Munangagwa, asking him to come over and have talks with him. And uh, vice president Munangagwa had refused to come into the country because mm. he was fearing for his security. So we, we went ahead with the impeachment process. Um, and um, as we were carrying out the impeachment process, um, halfway through it, uh, we then received, um, we then received uh, uh, a letter from the president where the president was actually resigning. Yes. So with the resignation, uh, we actually have an interesting situation in Zimbabwe. Uh, we don't have a president. Uh, there's actually a vacuum right now. So so come come tomorrow, the speaker has said, before the end of day tomorrow, the new president has to be inaugurated because we can't continue with the vacuum. And I think when, when we made the constitution, we never anticipated we'd have a situation like what we've just had today. Yeah, because, because this impeachment process was like the first, isn't it? This is like the first it's ever happened. It's... It's the first one that has ever happened. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, in Africa, it's probably the first one. It's the first one. I know in South Africa, they tried to do it, but like it failed to even go through the motion stage. We managed to 
uh, to go through the motions. And we, we, we managed to go through the motion and we're actually debating the, the motion. And if we had gone ahead with the motion, I can guarantee you by tomorrow you would have been impeached. You would, you would have uh, stopped being the president of the country. So, so what, what we're seeing to getting um, Terence um, is this, that Zimbabwe somehow has shine a light as to how things can actually happen in Africa because that's why they keep saying about bloodless coup. I call it a, a, a coup de love. Not <laughs> that's why I call it a coup de love. I, I, no, I, I think I need to correct that statement yes, for yes, you. Please. Firstly, it was not a coup. Okay. I think that's... That, that's one thing I think that we have taught Africa, that it's possible for the military to intervene without have them staging a coup. Because when the military inter intervened, it intervened uh, according to the dictates of the constitution. Because the constitution of Zimbabwe says that um, um, the, 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 Zim the Zimbabwean military establishment is there to protect the people, to protect the land, to, con to, to protect the constitution of the land. So the first thing that the military realized was that the constitution of the land was being violated by the first lady and everyone around the first lady. So they, they, they intervened to make sure that they restore the constitution of the land. Yes. So, so that's why from day one, they say that this is not a military coup. The president was still the president, but they were restoring order. So, so, so I think it's, some, it's, it's a lesson. It's a lesson for everyone. It's, it's something that's unheard of where the military steps in, where they, they could easily have taken over power yeah. and we could easily have had a general saying that he's now the leader of the country. But he didn't do that. What the military said is that we are going to make sure that the constitution continues functioning, the courts continue functioning, parliament continues functioning, all the arms of state have to continue functioning, and all we're going to do is to make sure that the constitution, uh, the constitution is restored. So this is a great lesson for everybody to say that not all military men are bad, and they've actually shown this in this country, that like, the military can be one with the people. Fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining, I have uh, the Honorable Mr. Terence Mukope, who is one of the members of parliament in Zimbabwe, who is joining and sharing with us as to the developments on the ground. If you don't mind, if you just press share at this present moment and um, invite your friends and family. And plus as well, if you want to ask any questions for Mr. Mukope in regards to Zimbabwe, please let us know. You see, Mr. Is it Terence, one of the things that people are saying is that um, there's this issue about leaders, especially in Africa, sometimes not knowing when to step down. I believe Zip, um, South Africa sort of showed a template there. And what we had here is a 93-year-old, I call him a, a hero, really. That's why I call him. You may have seen my note, which I put up there. But, but do we, are, are we setting out transition plans, succession plans? For future leaders from what has happened sir um i think what you have to realize is that um almost every founding father in africa yeah has always had problems with letting go of power yes i, I think there's some paranoia that's attached with all the founding fathers you know i can i can talk of you know the kenneth kaundas the julius Nyerere's. Yes. um you know you you you, you, you talk about the seku tures uh, to, you know, all, almost, you know, Kwame Nkrumah, they all face the same problem. But like what you then realize is that like, I think Mandela was, uh, Mandela was unique and because he's, he's one of the few founding presidents in Africa who was able to let go of power and have a proper succession, right? Yeah. Um, but I think when you, when you move away from the founding fathers, yes. uh, what you seem to have, that's when you start having your proper democracies. But mind you, it's not unique to Africa. I mean, I always give the the the, the, the example of even George Washington. George Washington ruled for 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 for, for over twenty years, right? Yes. Uh, when you look at all the founding presidents, the founding leaders of even some of the European nations, it, it's it's the same. It's the same scenario. So I don't want to make it seem as if it's an it's something that's unique to Africa. Because then the next thing is we start uh, berating African leaders as if they're, 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 they're abnormal and it's not the norm. But it's across the world. Every person who, who's ever been a founding president, they always end up feeling that everyone should be beholden to them. And mm -hmm. they brought the freedom so they should rule forever. 
and, and somehow feeling a bit of a responsibility to ensure that when they pass the legacy, they feel a sense of ownership, the sense of um, responsibility to ensure the legacy is alive? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I think this, this is something that calls for um, a study of the mindset. I think, you know, power corrupts. Like, there's always the statement that power corrupts and it corrupts absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because you can imagine, if, uh, uh, you know, if I take my president, you, you've got a lifestyle where every day uh, people come to you. When you want to see someone, they come to you when you want them to, to, to come to you. When you say something, it gets done. You know, when you have to travel anywhere, everybody opens the street for you. And for you to live that lifestyle and become an ordinary person, I think it becomes a psychological issue that, like, just letting go of power becomes a very difficult thing. And I think, um, I, I think there's, uh, there's also an issue that, like, um, no one ever really trains these leaders uh, to accept that it's perfectly okay for you to be able to get out of power. And remember, mind you, uh, when you look at President Robert Mugabe, no other leader before him he had let go of power willingly. Because, mind you, like, when you look at the white presidents who were there, the white prime ministers who had, were there before him, they'd gone for, like, 15 years, 20 years as prime ministers. So it was normal. It was a normal thing. Yeah. Uh, look at Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher was, uh, was, a, was a prime minister for, what, over 20 years? Something like that? Yeah. Right. Look at uh, Angela Merkel. How long has she been in power? Well, actually, she's been in power for yeah, well, actually, she, yes. she, there are questions and about her stewardship now because she's trying to um she, secure yeah. she doesn't want she doesn't want to let go of power so all, all i'm just pointing out is that like i think um let's move away from from making it seem as if it's a it's an african problem but like i think it's it's more of a of a, of a, that's the human nature go to the churches even like when you're going to church institutions you'll find the guys who lead these churches don't even want to let go of the leadership of, of their churches because they end up feeling that oh, all the spirituality comes through only them and no one else. A question which has been asked, and, 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 and uh, I'm opening this up for people uh, to be interactive, is why did the parliamentarians, which is yourselves, fail to do what the army did? Because it, it is, it, it is it's like, a, sorry, please, sir. Yeah. It's a very simple thing. You see, in, in Zimbabwe, in my party, ZANU-PF, we've got a one center of power. When you go to the Congress where, you, where the leader of the party is elected, there's only one person who's elected into power, and that's the first secretary of the party. So you'd have a situation where Mugabe would be elected as the only leader of the party. And then he appoints everyone at his pleasure. Yes. So all the other positions in the party are all appointees of the president. So he can hire and fire anybody at will. Right. So when you've got such a scenario, uh, he becomes a strong man. He becomes a very strong person, a very a very powerful person. So it's not as simple as, as people would put it that like you can be able to challenge him. Because if you challenge him, he can literally just wake up and tell you that like, okay, um, I'm kicking you out of the party and there's nothing that you can do about it. You can go to any court, it's perfectly legal. So the same thing with government. Everyone is appointed at his pleasure. So he becomes a very powerful person. So any, so the only way that you can be able to, 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 to confront him is if it's the collective that's coming together and uh, challenging him for power. So that's why you find what the president Mugabe was trying to do he knew that in December we had, a, we had an elective Congress, and the writing was on the wall that we were going to elect the vice president to become to become his successor. So what he started doing was that he started firing everyone from the party, purging everyone from the party, and there was nothing that you could do because he had all the power to be able to do that. But the army as an institution was intact, and there was nothing that he could do to the army. Well, uh, Terence, you know... I I'm happy uh, because I'm a sense of elation as to what's happening in Zimbabwe. And, uh, and I feel somewhat of a sort of closeness as my fellow brothers and sisters, because I'm from Jamaica. And uh, there's a saying in Jamaica whereby you swap black dog for monkey. You swap black dog for monkey. I don't know if you know that saying. And uh, many people are saying that uh, you swap Mugabe for crocodile. Right? Now, yeah. the question is, 
you said that the, the president has this so much power. It, it is possible that the next president will be the crocodile. Um, how do we ensure that the similar thing that happened don't happen again? I mean, they're all in the same team, um, the liberators. Yes. And we're seeing the same set of person in a young nation with uh, lots of young people like yourselves. Um, what is the message that he's saying at the same time? Um, you know what? Everyone in the party has agreed that like, we no longer want these uh, uh, strong men, politicians, and like, where we have a cult, where it becomes cultish politics. Mind you, yeah. this problem is not just within the party, Zanubia. Even within the opposition party, the MDC, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, there were situations where party members in the opposition have tried to, to get rid of the, the, the opposition president. Mm -hmm. And he's turned around and fired everyone. Because politics in Zimbabwe is set up in such a way that, like, the head of the party, you know, you can't separate the person who's the head of the party and the party. Mm. It, it becomes one and the same thing. So what we say to ourselves is that this is the last time we're going to allow this. We're going to have to have a situation where we change the constitution. This business of just saying that only one person is elected, we want to do away with it. All the positions have to be elected. You must elect everyone into their position mm. that they serve for a five-year term. So if positions are elected, you're not going to have one person who's super powerful. And I think the other thing that we're also going to make sure is that, like, for instance, you know, when you look at the letter end of our party, it had the face of the president. And we've said we are going to do away with that. Yeah. You can't have the letter end of the party having the face of a person. The letter end of the party should have the insignia, should have the logo of the oh, party. Okay. This issue of having to say when I'm wearing party regalia, it must have the face of the president. That also is going away. We are not going to be a cult. We are going to be a party that's founded on principles, and we must be a party that's found, founded on values that we all believe in. That's what's important. There's a quick point which was uh, flagged up, and that was Morgan... Uh... The, the opposition leader who, who was in South Africa, yeah. Morgan. Uh, and there was this discussion about should there be some sort of coalition and he was going to come back and everything. And uh, words came out from Zano Party saying, this is not a, a coalition issue. This is not an opposition issue. This is actually a Zano uh, Party issue, really. Is that correct there? Yeah. Yes, let's, let's go to the Constitution. Yeah. The Constitution says that Zano PF won the election in 2013. So the president of the country till 2018 has to be a ZANU PF president. Yes. So I, I, I don't understand when people say to us we have to have a coalition. Why should we have a coalition? We won the election. The constitution is clear that like if we fire our president, we can bring in another president from our party. Mm. So if, if the MDC, I can bet you, if the MDC were to go to elections and they were to win an election, I can guarantee you that they would not want to go to, into a coalition. Why would they want to share the cake with Zanupia? Right? So the person, with our constitution is very clear. Whoever has won should basically be the one who, who rules until 2018. It's just as simple as mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, let's go back to Zimbabwe and to the start of the legacy of M Mugabe, Robert Gabriel Mugabe. Uh, it, it's a love affair. At the same time, the people of Zimbabwe love it, and someone might misconstrue the, the the celebration that he's gone as one that he was this evening. But there's this love affair with Mugabe, isn't it? What's the what will be the legacy of Mugabe, Sir Terence? Uh, you know what? I I always say this: uh, the president was in power for 37 years. Yes. When you're evaluating uh, the president. You have to look at everything in its totality from 1980 up to now. What are the good things that he's done? What are the bad things that he's done? And I think for me, uh, there are certain things that stick out when you're talking about Mugabe. One, the, I think what's always top on everyone's lips is the fact that like he did a great job in terms of education because like our literacy rates are really high, right? Yes. The other thing that he did that he did a great job, um, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, was everything to do with uh, with the land reform program. Um, it was a good principle in terms of making sure that the land comes back to the 
to us, the, the indigenous blacks. But like, I think things could have been done better in terms of how he went about the land reform program. There were things that could have been done much better. And then I think there's also the issue that like, um, um, there's also the issue of uh, um, things to do with how we've made sure that our economy, when you come to Zimbabwe, almost every business that you can think about, it's all in the hands of us, the, the locals. But like, I think the only thing that's missing is that like we need the necessary funding, the necessary lines of credit. Yeah. We need to make sure that our financial institutions are ticking so that we can get the capacity utilizations up. And I think the other thing that you can probably give to the president is that like, you know, there's, there's always been talk about the uh, human rights and everything. But like, I can tell you this, people are free to express their, their minds in Zimbabwe. You can say what you feel, you can do whatever it is that you want to do in Zimbabwe. I've been to other African countries. You can never denigrate the president the way you do it here. I'll give you a good example. Yeah. If you go to Rwanda, Rwanda right now, everyone talks about how lovely Rwanda is. Do you realize the lady who decided to, to, to contest against Kagame in the Rwandan elections was actually disqualified from from contesting the elections and right now as i speak is actually in prison right go to uganda kiza bezige who was uh who, who was who always contests against yoweri Museveni in elections every year do you realize that he only comes into uganda during the week of the elections and every other time he's not even in uganda so so when you look at all of these things and you compare with what happens here None of that nonsense happens in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. People are able to go out, you campaign, you do whatever it is. Yes, there are things that can be improved on. Yeah. But like we're way better than your average African country. And I know some people will say, why compare yourself with all these other African countries? Why not compare yourself with Europe? We're a young democracy. We're going to get there. Yeah. And, um, and like I'll say, like sometimes I'd like to compare myself with our brothers across across the across the Limpopo in South Africa. Yeah. When you look at our elections, when you see the number of people that die in this country during elections, and when you compare the number of people that die in South Africa during elections, our, uh, the people that die here are less than 1% of the numbers of people that die in South Africa. So sometimes you notice that it's a propaganda that was around the person of Mugabe that made it seem as if this country is, has become such a bad place and such a pariah state. Um, if anything... I would want to believe that President Mugabe gave us that freedom. But I think the problem that we had with them was that he was failing to realize that at 93 years old, you can no longer continue going. Mm -hmm. It was time for him to retire. He had a crazy, a crazy wife as a first lady. And I think that was the cause of most of the problems that we had. Uh, we were having in this country. Is she out of the country or is she still in the country? Or, or what, what, what's the situation with her? I think the army said they were um, protecting the country and getting rid of some of these individuals or these criminals around the, um, the, the president. She is, the, the, the president and the, and, and the first lady are still in Zimbabwe. Uh, what, I, what I understand is the two main culprits that everyone wanted to see in prison managed to skip the country. That's Jonathan Moore and uh, Savia Kasukwere. They managed to skip the country, but like um, I think wherever they are, we're going to eventually hunt them down and get hold of them. Mm -hmm. Someone said, um, someone said that uh, 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 they, they were sort of given a level of caution um, because a couple of days ago we had the situation whereby everyone was expecting uh, Mugabe to resign, and when he didn't resign after that long speech, and it, it, it not, not makes sense, we we dissect the speech now because it's somewhat a bit irrelevant now when he said the progress of the progressive or whatever like that. But the, the, you could see the deflation, how people were deflated when um, he didn't step down. And someone said earlier, um, don't get too excited because you may be going the same way as South Africa in the sense whereby there is that level of hope and that joy when people um black rule came to south africa but somewhat it seemed as if it has not translated into such transfer of power of wealth um le le i think there's always a word of caution right with um uh people that are in power you, you know the right now what you have is that the levels of expectations are, are super high yes everyone is believing that we're going to become a better country, uh, a better nation. 
you know, we guys are at rock bottom. I, I, I can never imagine a situation whereby the next president of Zimbabwe can do worse than what, uh, the, than what President Mugabe had done in the last five, five to ten years. Yes. Anyone who's coming is going to do much better. And remember, the country is coming from a low base. So if the key thing for us as a country is that the sanctions that are on Zimbabwe have to go, if, if those sanctions go away and we've got the necessary lines of credit, and we are treated like any other country in the world. There's absolutely no reason why our country shouldn't do well. We've got a strong country. Let me put it this way. Yes, if any other African country had been on sanctions for as long as Zimbabwe has been on sanctions, they would have crumbled. That just shows you like how strong the Zimbabwean base is. We've got a strong base economically. And all that's just missing is the necessary investment for us to be able to jumpstart this economy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to some questions here, um, 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 Terence. And ladies and gentlemen, I've got a member of parliament from Zimbabwe, Mr. Terence Mukherpe, um from Zimbabwe, who is online here. And uh, please share the video as you can. Just press share and like. Um, someone said, why should people even die during elections? I mean, uh, that's a question that someone, why should people even die? This is from a Zimbabwe I here. I think they didn't they didn't understand my the point I was making. Yeah. Um I did say that like people should die. But what I'm pointing out is that like the way we the way Zimbabwe was being characterized mm. as if it's the worst nation in Africa. Yeah. But like when you consider uh when you compare Zimbabwe to other African, the so called uh uh great democracies of Africa, yes. you'll actually see that way better and way advanced than those great democracies of Africa. That's when you see that, like, I think when the, the way the worst was approaching Zimbabwe, it had a lot of bias. That's the point I was making. Yes, yes. Okay, fantastic. Now, another person asked, is, um, is ZANU now, in go now going to embrace free and fair elections? I would want to believe we've always had free and fair elections. I've, I've never seen any... We always have observers in Zimbabwe. SADC has always observed all our elections. Mm -hmm. So give me any SADC report which said that any of our elections was not free and fair. Right. Not even one report. So if you're saying to me that the members of SADC, of the Southern African Development Community, which is the regional body which polices all our elections, as well as the, as well as the African Union, they've always said our elections were free and fair. So I, I don't know where he's getting that, that like when are we going to get free and fair elections? You see, the problem is that like when people are of, from the opposition, if they don't win an election, the first thing that they do is they start crying out that like, oh, they're not free and fair. They start calling elections not free and fair before you've even gone to the elections. Mm -hmm. What they should be doing is not, not wasting their time uh, vilifying ZANU-PF, but spending their time going out to the electorate, yeah. talking to the electorate, registering people to vote, selling selling your vision, selling what it is that you feel you can be able to do for the country. Yes. And that's what's important. That's what wins you an election and not playing to the gallery. Okay. Well, one of the things that I want to do, and I'm not going to keep you much longer, but I'm just going to go moving forward now. Um, like someone said, which is a good way to move on to this, we have resources, knowledge, and skills, so with the right investment, we'll be the lead in Africa. Now, what would we? What do you say now? And clarify for the for the benefit of people who are watching from Jamaica, USA, um, in Zimbabwe. What are the key minerals, the key wealth of Zimbabwe? Okay, um, the key minerals that we've got in Zimbabwe, uh, top of the list is actually gold. Yeah. We are producing about twenty tons of gold right now. Uh, the expectation is that by the twenty tons per year. The expectation is that probably this year we're going to be at about 24 tons of gold. Uh, the second largest mineral that we export out of Zimbabwe is, um, is uh, platinum, the platinum group metals. Uh, right now, uh, we've, got, uh, two, we've got two platinum mines that are operating with a market valuation of over $6 billion. Yes. There's uh, three other platinum uh, entities that are being opened. At 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 um at uh, at an investment value of close to three billion dollars, yeah. so the platinum group metals are really doing well. Then the the third 
the third mineral that we've got that's also doing quite well is uh, we've got we've got a lot of diamonds. Yes. Um, and there have been uh, there was a time when all the diamond mines were in private hands, and there was a lot of um, you know abuse of of funds and everything, and all of these mines have been nationalized. There was a lot of corruption around around diamonds. And now, because it's in the hands of government, we feel that there's greater accountability. Another mineral that we've got, which is really on the up and up, is, uh, is chrome. We've got the world's second largest chrome deposit. People don't even mm. realize this. We've got, more, we've got more chrome than the whole of Europe and, uh, and, 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 and Russia combined. Um, those, I would say, like, are probably the key minerals that we have. But what's actually interesting about Zimbabwe is that, like, um, almost every mineral that you can think of, any mineral that you can think of, it's found in Zimbabwe. Be it, be it uranium, be it emeralds, be it graphite, anything you can think of, it's found in Zimbabwe. So, Terry. And for the most part... Keep yeah, sorry, keep talking. For the most part, our minerals are actually open castable. So you're not even talking of minerals where you have to go and dig deep shafts. Everything is still on the surface. And all we need is just really people to come and do feasibility studies and put money into this into these minerals. Well, Terence, it, it seems like there's a, a new awakening and it's a new dispensation and it's a new paradigm shift. What is the US dollar or, or the equivalent of this, the, the Zimbabwean dollar to the US dollar for argument's sake? Okay, what we did is that um, when we went through the hyperinflationary environment, we got rid of the of the Zimbabwean currency. So Zimbabwe does not have a currency. Right. So the the we actually operate using a basket of currencies. Uh, you can you can when you're in Zimbabwe, you can either trade in U.S. dollars, rands, South African rand, the Chinese the Chinese yen. Uh, those are recognizable currencies in Zimbabwe. Yeah. But what we've also done is that we've, uh, we've introduced a derivative currency, what we call bond notes. And these bond notes officially are pegged one is to one with the US dollar. But what has been happening is that of late, uh, they, those bond notes have devalued by about 80%. So which means like that for, for, every, like, um, for every one US dollar, that you've got a physical one US dollar, you get as much as a dollar eighty uh, bond notes, and this is all has been a function of the fact that like we have a trade balance deficit which wasn't working well because of the fact that we really don't have access to external lines of credit. Terence, I must say though, it it is it is shocking, and you will agree that it is shocking that um, in Africa today the wealth, um, the resources of Africa is so profound that we find ourselves in this position. How do we move forward then? Because Africa is a leading light for the black nation. You know what I mean? It's like the success of Africa is a success of our people. Okay, let me start with this. The problem with Africa is about confidence. Mm. The citizens never have confidence in their own economy. Mm. So when the citizens don't have confidence in their own economy, the foreign investors will also find it difficult to come into their, into their economy. And then what you have to investigate is that why is it the citizens don't have confidence in their, in their own economy? The reason why they don't have confidence in their own economy is because of governance issues. It's because of corruption issues. It's because of the political establishment, the way the, the, way the state institutions are not independent and strong. Because mm. you will find that like everyone will talk about corruption, corruption. But like you never have anyone being prosecuted for, for corruption in Africa. It's always the fact that like the poor people are the ones who always find themselves in prison. But those who've got money are never found going to prison. As long as you've got money, you can buy your way out. So if we don't strengthen our institutions and start saying that like, you know, um, a crime is a crime, irrespective of your social standing. You know, if you commit a crime, you have to go to prison. Yes. If that happens then you're going, you're going to have a situation where Africa starts developing. Yes. And, and um, bear with me for a few moments. Um, the issue of corruption, as someone said, is a huge one at the moment. What will be done to reduce or eradicate this? Well, the first thing is that you need a strong leader. Okay. I, I always want to give the example of the, the founding father of uh, Singapore. 
you know when 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 he started the state of singapore it used to be just a marshland where which was just growing rice but the guy who took over singapore the first thing that he did is that like he made it he basically put in almost like a sharia type of law in place where you know if you if you messed around if you became corrupt you know he would execute people and i think that's an extreme end but like all i'm just trying to highlight is that like we should take issues of corruption seriously mm-hmm. i mean you left people here when you find people that are celebrated here in zimbabwe most of them are thieves the people who are stealing from government and nothing ever happens to them and what you're saying is that with the new dispensation it's high time we started having some of these high profile people yes. being put in prison if we put high profile people in prison then people are going to see that we're serious mm. and i know for a fact right now as we sit i think there's a list of close to 500 people that have got cases where people are going to be put in prison and i've got no doubt that this incoming president watch watch the space people are going to be shocked high profile people are going to go into prison and that's the crocodile factor that's a crocodile factor i guess <laughs> <laughs> um how much longer do you have you want to look at a couple more questions sir um that, that's fine that's fine you can, i can go on yes you can go on yes you can go on. Um, gladys musura is saying we're hoping to get young generation in government to help rebuild the nation without greed and corruption we have economists in UK from Zimbabwe advising ministers. These can be this these can do they can do that in Zimbabwe. We need human rights law, not intimidation. You see, because there's been that factor there under the uh, Mugabe regime of this level of intimidation. It depends on which side you're coming from. If you first come from another side, they'll say this. From the Zana side, they'll say that. What's your take on what Gladys has said? Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's a great point. Mm. You know, let me tell you, I went to to Rwanda on a, on, a, on a visit, on a study visit, and I've got friends there. When you go to Rwanda, the first thing that I noticed was that, like, when I was seeing the, the people who were running parastatals, most of them were, like, in their 30s, you know, between 30 and 40. That was the age of guys running parastatals. Yeah. When you see their ministers, they were all young guys, very young guys. And like all of them were like Harvard trained, you know, they've been to Oxford University, you know, they've been to New York University. And what was that, what Kagame did was that like when he decided that he wanted to rebuild the nation, he went out into the diaspora and found talented people that he managed to get them back into the country, yeah. paid them same salaries that they were earning in Europe, that they were earning in America, and made sure that they came back and started rebuilding the country. I'll give you also another example. When you go to Kenya, I went to Kenya as well, like like two months two months back. The Kenyan constitution says that if you are a member of parliament, you cannot be a minister. What that does is that you know what the president, when he decides to to come up with his cabinet, he will actually go into industry. If he needs a minister of industry, you get someone in in the ministry. You get an industrial person who's not a politician who will come and start running the Ministry of Industry. If he needs a finance guy, he will go into the financial sector and get a financial sector. Ministry of Health, he goes into the health sector. So so we need something like that where we realize that it's not an issue of uh, repaying your cronies, repaying your friends. Because I think that was one of the downfalls of our president. That like you, you ended up having the Minister of Industry and Commerce being his brother-in-law. The Minister of Mines was also his brother-in-law. Mm. Uh, the Minister of Labor was his, uh, was his nephew. Uh, the, the Minister of uh, Tourism was also was his wife's, was his brother-in-law. Um, you, know, you, you end up having almost, it's just the entire family of the, the, all, almost every ministry. So you had to be related to the president for you to become a minister. Wow. And that's what kills us. Because there's no way I can have all my family members being technocrats. What we're saying is that move away from sticking to your family members. It should become a meritocracy. I don't, I, you know what, if you're good at your job, I don't have to like you. But I should put you there because you're good at your job. Mm-hmm. And I feel that like you can be able to make a difference into to this nation. That's all that's important. Well, someone just said here then, isn't then a, a, a good reason then, um, Terence, for two-term limits for presidents? Like in America. Is no, that something that... We're um, already that. Sorry, please, sorry. 
the Zimbabwe constitution has got a two term limit. The new constitution. Mugabe was running for his second term. Because the, remember, the new constitution uh, was, was came into place in t- for the 2013 elections. So 2013 was his first term. 2018 wow. was going to be his second term. So any other president who's going to come in is going to be stuck with two term limits. Okay, so that answered the question. So, but, so like, if, but, right, but, but my, issue, my issue is this. If the president can have two terms, the problem that we have in Zimbabwe is that the people that run state institutions end up staying in their jobs for 20 years, 30 years. That's the biggest issue. You also need to say that if the president can have two terms, why shouldn't people running government institutions also have two terms? We should have term limits for everybody. As long as you are at a, in a senior position in government at a certain level, there should be a term limit. I've got a guy who runs the, the banking surveillance unit at the Reserve Bank. This guy has presided over all the failed banks in Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. Not even a single person has ever been prosecuted. And up to this day, he's still the director, he's still the director of banking surveillance. Why are we keeping such people? Why don't we retire those people? Why don't we introduce two term limits? So my take is that the president who's coming in, it's not for him, it's not an issue of fixing the economy. But I think his number one um, uh, his number one goal should be strengthening state institutions. Because mm. if those state institutions are not strengthened, whatever it is that you're trying to do is going to be in vain. Wow. Well, that's powerful. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I've got um, the Honorable um, Member of Parliament of Zimbabwe, Mr. Terence Mukope, who has um, <clears throat> decided to stay late in the night to have a chat with us. <clears throat> because, you see, I saw you today on channel on Sky News. Yeah. Yes. And I said to myself, well, yes. we were supposed to link last night and we got sort of mixed up with the time. I wanted to somehow see what happened today. And when I saw you on Sky News, I said, that's not fair. You have to come onto the Black Network. <laughs> You've got to be on Silver TV. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that because sometimes we, give, yeah. We, yeah. We, we have to build. Uh, there's a move in the UK uh, for uh, Black empowerment. You know, the... the um, yeah. The, the solution room. People are looking to see how black people can empower. And when we see things like this happening in Africa, it, it's a boost to because Africa is our motherland, um, Terence. And it gives us a level yes. of excitement. I was in church on Sunday. We prayed for Zimbabwe. Well, we prayed for, oh, it was an international day. Uh, Jamaica is a part of yeah. Africa, even though we're in the Caribbean. We, yeah. we emanate from the roots there. So it, it is so crucial that this happened. And I can only speak words of encouragement. I mean, I, 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 many people are elated. Not just every the eyes of the world is upon Zimbabwe at this moment. But there's a question which has been asked now. For it is by Chad Mature. It's about HIV. Our biggest enemy in primary schools. Over 20% are positive. In high school, over 30% colleges in the high 40s, and we use it 80%. There is a health factor there at the same time. Yeah, um, the the HIV scourge, uh, that's a problem. Yes. Um, but I, I think like when you look at the stats, Zimbabwe has actually been doing very well because like when you look at the HIV prevalence rates, they've actually come down. I think what's really important for us is to make sure that like we have less of the AIDS related deaths, because I think with the advance in medication right now, um. Uh, for if one becomes HIV positive, it should not mean that like uh, that becomes uh, a death sentence to you. You know, I I come from a situation that like my own mother actually died from from HIV related from an HIV related disease. So I I I, I actually I'm actually someone who who understands that disease and like had to live through it and 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 see the effect of it but like all i'm all i'm just pointing out is that like the government together with um um uh, there's been some um, some donor agencies yeah. that have been providing medication but the problem that we have in zimbabwe it's not about medication because the medication is for free for people that are hiv positive the problem is about uh diet 
food related issues because when you're on that medication you have to make sure that you're having the proper, proper diet <clears throat> so because of the the, the 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 state of our economy and how things have just been difficult for everybody um you'll find that most people end up not being able to live for the 20 30 years that you're supposed to live because because you're not getting the proper food you're not getting the proper vegetables you're not getting the proper diet that's that's what the problem is so it's not a problem of drugs but it's a problem of uh making sure that people have access to affordable food good quality food mm -hmm. okay um in, in wrapping up what is your vision now for the new zimbabwe my, uh, you know, the thing that I really, uh, that I really liked about what happened was that for the first time, all Zimbabweans came together and they realized that it's no longer a ZANU-PF thing, an FGC thing. The first thing that matters is that we are all Zimbabweans. We want the same thing. We might have different ideologies. We might have different views of how we get to the promised land. But mind you, we all want to get to the promised land. So I would actually prefer a situation where people stop becoming couch politicians or Twitter politicians or what I call WhatsApp politicians and start getting onto the ground and start working. It's very easy for anyone to become a critic and criticize everything that we're doing and criticize everything that politicians are doing. Get out of your comfort zone. Come and join us. I, I, if you look at myself, I'm a Wall Street tra trained banker. I went to the best institution in, in university-wise. I, I, I was on a six six figure uh, salary, you know, and I, I, I basically left that behind me because I wanted to make a difference and to rebuild my nation. And I came to Zimbabwe on a mission, saying that I'm going to change things in my country. I can't leave the destiny of my country in the hands of other people. I could have chosen to stay in America, you know, eating caviar every day, um, enjoying jazz every day. I actually miss listening to blues and, and all of that. Yes. But I came into the trenches to change my country, yes. to make sure that it becomes a better country. And guess what? I have, I'm happy that I've played my part. I, my life was in danger. I almost lost my life because I, I challenged the establishment. I challenged Mugabe. I challenged the status quo. And guess what? It has paid off. Now we've got a new dispensation. So all I'm just saying to the people in the diaspora, you've got a role to play. Don't, don't say that because you're there, you can't have a role in Zimbabwe. Now is the time for you to be able to say, hey, what you're waiting for, that inflection point is here. Come back. Let's rebuild this nation. No one is going to rebuild this nation except us, the Zimbabweans. So therefore, you're, this is a call for Zimbabweans to come home. Come home. If you're not coming home, make sure that whatever money you're earning there, invest it in Zimbabwe. Make sure that if you're going to buy any real estate, buy your real estate in Zimbabwe. Let's rebuild this country together. Don't, don't, I would say, like, instead of, like, wasting your money there, bowling in London, bowling in, uh, uh, in the streets of New York, in the streets of Johannesburg, put your money to good use. Make sure that it develops Zimbabwe. Make sure that you sponsor a child here. Like, I, I, I always give an example that, like, you know, if you go to the rural areas, it costs you less than $30 to sponsor a child to go through school for a whole year. Thirty dollars won't even buy you won't even buy you a shot in 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 in, in, uh, uh, in in downtown London, right? And I'm saying, what if you could then change your mindset and say, like, okay, let me change the future of some other Zimbabwe child? Then that's that's going to be a good thing. Come to Zimbabwe, buy real estate, put money into real estate. Let's rebuild this country together. So therefore, if myself or other persons in the wider African diaspora from the Caribbean, the USA, or whatever, like yes. you are saying there are opportunities which are going to be unleashed in Zimbabwe. Uh, you know what? You're coming off a law base, like I've said. Yeah. This is a country that was at the law base because it's at a law base. We can only go up as a country. Things can only get better. And I can tell you that, like, in terms of your rate of return or, on any investment here, it's going to be much better. We, I can tell you that like putting money into our stock market, you, you can be guaranteed that our stock market is going to go through the roof. Yeah. Take a chance on that. If you've got a portfolio of your stocks, 
where probably you're saying that like yeah i'm willing to put five percent into risky into risky assets then put that five percent into zimbabwe mm. buy some zimbabwe stock on the zimbabwe stock exchange and you would have done your bit you would have helped in rebuilding this country I'm, I'm trying to go, but the questions are coming. <laughs> I'm, I'm terrible. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Chinese. There's a lot of Chinese investors. Are, are, you, you, you mentioned earlier about people are a bit scared of maybe wanting to invest, but at the same time, you've got China, which is coming. The, the, recently, they said the, the general went to China and he was somewhat behind. China was somewhat behind this particular move. Is there any truth in that? And what is happening with China? Because, sorry, before you respond, in Jamaica, there's also this thrust by China and people have been very concerned about this. Like China is somewhat seeking to monopolize, colonialize somewhat the African diaspora. Yeah. You, you see, here's the issue. The Chinese model is such that like when they come into their country, into your country, they don't go into partnership with the citizens but they go into partnership with the government. And what they will do is that they will come and they will build all this infrastructure for you, and then you have to then uh, come up with ways of paying back for the infrastructure. So it's what's important is for your government to be responsible enough to make sure that the infrastructure that you're building, it's infrastructure that's beneficial to the nation. Because there's no point in them coming and putting up... Uh, a, a multi-billion dollar bridge to Norway. Mm. But like if they're going to come in and uh, revamp your, enti your entire railway infrastructure, that's good because it means that like your trade facilities are going to function well. Your mines, when they move, their produce are going to function well. So it's it's actually a good thing. And I think also, I think there's, uh, there's uh, also the second way that Chinese people also come into African countries. The individuals, when they come into Africa, they don't come to really set up any factories. What they do is that they come and dump goods. That's the type of uh, investment that we don't want. Because when you're coming to dump your cheap goods into our country, what you're basically doing is that you're, you're mopping up all the U.S. dollars that we would have struggled to raise when we sold our tobacco, sold our gold, sold our diamonds into the international community. Only for you to bring, you know, uh, a, cheap, a cheap slop or cheap t-shirts. That's something that we don't want. But what we're saying is that the kind of investment we want in Zimbabwe is a win-win type of investment. An investment that's sustainable, an investment that's going to impact on people's lives. That's what we want. Mm. Is the government going to move, as, as someone said, move from the... Uh, let, me just, let me just get this uh, a second. Um, um, just, just get this question here that someone just asked. Is the... Government, uh, it, it, they're, they're talking about these different farms, which are being owned by different persons. Person owned three farms or so. Um, you know, after things were taken away from the white people or so. You know, that's the place. Yeah, the, the issue of the farms is a big one. I, I'm a member of parliament. I've tried to get a farm for the past two years. I failed to get a farm. Mm. But like people who were linked to the establishment, who were linked, uh, close family members of the last president who would get farms like that. Right. The last president had about 17 farms. Wow. Right. So what we're saying is that those are some of the things we're saying we'll have to, we're going to have a proper audit of all the land. What we're saying is that like where people can show that they can be able to farm. You should be able to get to get farming land. And again, it's even the issue of, I know we, we still, we're getting the question about those white farmers who want to farm. Even if you're a white farmer who wants to farm, there's enough land for everybody to be able to what? To farm. But what we're saying is that this issue of having multiple farms where you'd have people having 3,000 hectare farms, and yet, like, for the most part, all the land that they are farming is less than 50 hectares. Why would you have a 3,000 hectare farm? So we're saying that all these farms have to be rationalized. And once they've been rationalized, we give everyone a farm. Mm. Do you know, like, when you're looking at sugarcane, 
you don't even need more than 30 hectares of land for you to be an effective sugarcane farmer. Mm. When you're looking at tobacco, for the most part, you don't need more than 60 hectares of land for you to be an effective tobacco farmer. When you're looking at maize, you don't need more than 200 hectares of land for you to become an effective maize farmer. Mm. So why would you have someone with thousands of hectares of land for farming? So the only time that you need uh, a large hectare of land, it's like when you're, when you're into cattle breeding or animal husbandry. But like with animal husbandry, it's specific types of land which are not suitable for, for crop farming. So what we're saying is that let's carry out an audit. Let's take away the farms from people that are, are now taking it as if like it's fashionable for you to own a farm. You know, this is a, this is a resource that should be put to good use. So the question then is this. Will, just like how Mugabe took away lands from the white farmers, will Zano and the government start to take away lands from the henchmen that was surrounding Mugabe the family, even uh, someone said, um, I don't know the politics of Zimbabwe, but I'm picking up some discussions from persons saying his wife and her sons have these lands, <laughs> with these starting to come back into the fold. So you can get one at least and then give me one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what's going to happen. You know, what we're saying is that let, let's carry out an audit. Let's find out who owns what. Um, there was a report we had where someone gave uh, their three-year-old son a farm. Yeah. You know, it's things like that which you're saying that like should not should not be happening. And that's a former minister, Minister Goche. He gave his three-year-old son a farm. Wow. And what are we saying? And nothing ever happened to him because he used to be the state security minister of the president. And everyone will know that this is what has happened. And people, even if you'd speak about it, nothing would happen to him. So what we're saying is that an audit is going to happen. Farms, I, I know there's talk that the maximum farm size is going to be 100 hectares. No one is going to have more than 100 hectares unless if you can be able to show cause why it should be more than 100 hectares. But all farms are going to be a maximum of 100 hectares. Right, right. Well, I'm not going to keep it longer because I might invite another person to come on after. But I just want to ask you this question. So what happens now with Mugabe? now that he stepped down or has he stepped down will he come back tomorrow? We, we will, he, have, will he come back tomorrow let me just let me just make it very clear to everyone yes we love our president yes and right now as we speak right um up to the time of the congress he's still the first secretary of zanubia yes you the new first secretary of zanubia will only be confirmed at the at the congress we love our president what we were saying was that, like, he is old. Because he's old, he had people taking advantage of right. And those people that we take advantage of are the people that we're saying we should bring them to book. No one is saying that we should do anything to our president. If anything, he is still an icon. He is still our hero. He's done a lot for this country. He's still, we're saying that, like, he's going to be an elder statesman of the country. So this business of people thinking that, like, oh, he's going to be dragged to... To, to, to prison or something. For what? I'll say, I'll challenge anyone who says that Mugabe should be taken to prison. First, take George Bush and put him to prison for killing people in Iraq. And Tony Blair. Tony Blair. Mr. Blair. Mr. Blair. People in Libya, right? Yeah. Take the, if you take those guys to prison, then I'll take Mugabe to prison. Why should we always be taking our African leaders to prison? For what? When, when you've got the European and American leaders performing worse atrocities than us, and then you want to make it seem as if we guys are savages, no ways. Nothing is happening to our president. We're going to give him the respect and the dignity he deserves. He's going to enjoy his retirement. Well, as I said in the piece which I did, was said I see Mugabe as a hero, and I still see him as that. Um, but the key thing is that leaders uh, need to ensure that they have a succession plan. And leaders must make sure that they know when to step down so young, new, bread, <clears throat> fresh blood can come in. Someone just asked, what about the blue roof? Is it going to be taken? I don't know what that is. I'm just throwing that out. <laughs> I don't know. Why would you take up the blue roof? I mean, that's that's being petty. I don't know. Okay. I, I, the, just, I just showed that one. The, I don't know what that means. I just, yeah, yeah. No, the blue roof is, that's where the president says. That's his personal house. Right. Why would you want to take away his personal house? That's being evil. Right. And I'll say to that person who said that he needs to go to church. Okay, well, 
when you play. Well, they are listening. They are listening, um, um, Terence. So, Terence, listen. I want to thank you so much for joining. Yes, I, I think what time is thank it now? It is one o'clock after one. It's, yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's after. I, I think I'll have to keep you as my uh, Zimbabwean correspondent. <laughs> yes. I, and and I'll say we're we're looking forward to tomorrow. Tomorrow we're inaugurating the new president of Zimbabwe. Oh, that is Mr. Ma 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 what I can't pronounce his name. Uh, uh, um, Emerson Nangagwa. Right, right, right. So Emerson is. The new, we, we, I'm hoping it's Emerson who's going to be the president tomorrow. Right, right. So I I shouldn't assume it's going to be him, but we're hoping it's Emerson who's going to be the president tomorrow, and I think that um it, it will also come up with a new cabinet for the country. And so I would want to believe that cabinet, which is which is going to announce, will give people direction of what sort of president is going to be. And will Mr. Mugabe preside over the process of the process to ensure the process takes place? I, I I'm hoping that's going to be the case, because remember, Emerson had a father-son relationship with the president. He was in prison for ten years with President Mugabe. Yes, President Mugabe was in prison. People forget this. President Mugabe was in prison for 10 years. For 10 years, right? Um, and during those 10 years, part of those 10 years, Emerson was with him in prison. And Emerson was schooled by the president. The president was Emerson's lecturer. Yes. And that's how he ended up getting his education. People don't, don't realize this. So I would want to believe that whatever the case is, there's still no love lost between the two. All that Emerson was saying is that, like, I love my president, but my president should realize that it's time for him to rest. Right, right. And it's time for you to rest. For me to rest as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, it was, a, it, was a, it was thanks for sharing that and the heart of Zimbabwe. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Terence Mukape, Mukupe, 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 yeah. Mukupe um, who is Member of Parliament, um, in Zimbabwe and thank you so much for sharing and uh, uh, our heart and our blessings go with you and Zimbabwe um, I don't think I'll be able to sign off because a couple of persons might want to do a rebut <laughs> to, to <laughs> okay. I like to get the man the average man on the street um, uh, Moral Harrison is saying the people I'm seeing jumping up and down the street seems overdressed and well fed <laughs> That's in the city. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, we need to talk to the new president, ASAP MP. And, uh, and I trust also that the, the direction of the country will be one which is the two terms, uh, one which whereby yes. an effective succession plan for young leaders like yourself, yes. Greta, and also, most importantly, that the lands are distributed effectively and I can get one. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. That's... <laughs> there's always room for for another brother yeah and I'll, I'll also i'll say to people in the diaspora who are listening um uh, there's an invitation which is out there for us also to invest in zimbabwe um we used yes. to run a joke sometimes um Mokope, that uh if you want to be a millionaire just go to zimbabwe and it can be done instantly So, that's very funny. <laughs> okay, that's in the past now. That's, that's in the, the past, past now. It's, it's, now it takes slightly longer for you to make your million. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, yeah. um, um, Terence, and have a good rest. And I guess business starts tomorrow now. A new dimension, a new life, a new partnership, and all the best, sir, for your new family. And thank you to your wife. <laughs> Tell your wife thank you for, for allowing me to keep you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. All right. Good night. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Bye bye. And like, yeah, special mention to my cousin Chiesa for making this happen. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, it's so funny. I, I run this joke with her because she's supposed to be having the baby soon. But the baby's not coming until Mugabe yes. is gone. So maybe the baby will come now. <laughs> <laughs> she must be laughing now. Because she said, the baby's, yes. a, the baby's stubborn. So I said, let that baby be the next president. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because, sorry, before you go. All right. Before you go, the, there's this thing about when, yeah. when the queen or the king dies of the UK or in the world before they say, the king is dead, long live the king. The queen is dead, long live the king. 
And I believe that was something that Mugabe wanted. The, Mugabe is dead. Long live Grace Gucci. <laughs> Gucci Grace. <laughs> No, we're happy to see her back. No, okay. We're really happy to see her back. Anyhow, yeah, just... yeah, ne never again. Never again. Yeah, we, you should always remember that the role of a first lady is to go around the country smiling at everybody. She yes. should not open her mouth. Yes, it's just as period as that. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank okay. you very much, <laughs> and all the best, sir. All right. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Cheers. Bye. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining. I, I, I don't know, I've seen a, a couple of persons wanted to join in the discussion. And um, if you do want to do so, um, I can invite you um, to, to just sort of give a little feedback here, um, um, just to hear your views. I think um, that would be very good. And, and you know, so what, what I've done is... Um, uh, put an invite out there for uh, uh, I think it's trade. If if whoever wants to to come on, and I believe as well. So let me know if that still is. But I just want to thank so much for the member of parliament for Zimbabwe, um, Mr. Terence Mukopo, for joining a while ago. Um, I'm not going to stay long, but if anyone would like to maybe come on and give a sort of um, feedback as to what happened feel free of that if not i'll take leave but um i'm going to follow this up with um terence uh, we became um good contacts and tineshe mundo um you're there as well um john fisher uh chedesias chigare mugubo mugabe thank you for making this happen trade material thank you so much um um Tinashe, uh, Stanley, uh, Charity, um, for all the different persons who have joined. I want to thank you so much. And I do follow um, uh, Silburn TV and do click like and follow what I'm doing because what I'm doing is actually tapping into some key different issues. And at different times, I'll have different type of um, guests who are coming on. And we'll be following the Zimbabwe um, issue very closely. And... Um, and as much and remember to like subscribe to the silver and show um on youtube and follow the, the uh, all the different facebook live and and thank you thank you very much and uh, i wish you a, a good night and all the best thank you very much bye bye